The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. There's a lot of people who walk in deep darkness. The original meaning of these words was spoken while the southern kingdom of Judah was facing a war from its northern one-time ally and brother Israel and the Assyrians who had joined up against Judah and it was a desperate time. And Isaiah says that with the birth of a new king comes hope for the people of Judah. And you can see that every time there's a royal birth in England today. People get excited about stuff like that. And that's what, that's the original sense. But we've carried these words down the ages. I looked it up and it turns out that text has been used on Christmas for a very long time. In the very oldest lectionaries of the church, if they mention Christmas, they give us that reading. Darkness sometimes is for a people facing war. Sometimes darkness is for a group of people who find themselves so alienated from their own culture that they feel like strangers. Sometimes darkness is for an individual, sleepless at night, not knowing what may happen to a loved one in the hospital. Sometimes darkness is the darkness of depression, a darkness that can seem to see no end in sight. Sometimes the darkness is the darkness of poverty and oppression, of unfair treatment at the hands of others, of a denial of the goods that life has to offer. Sometimes the darkness is just simple misfortune. Sometimes the darkness is getting cut off unfairly in traffic and then getting so angry we realize there's a little bit of darkness inside in the lane we're in as well as the other one. We find ourselves frequently walking in darkness. I hope what I've said is not so foreign to you that you can't find some place where our happy American lives don't see some darkness. To a people that walked in darkness has come a great light. The light that shines in the darkness that the darkness has never been able to overcome. It's worth it for us to take a little moment before we get too abstract to look at the particular details of the gospel story of Jesus' birth as Luke tells it. And to remember what I think we know, but it bears underlining, that mangers are not cribs. And shepherds are not clean, decent people. And the inn didn't have no room because Mary and Joseph had forgotten to make a reservation or there were so many people it was full up. It didn't have any room because they didn't have any money. And the manger is a sign, a symbol of the structures of a world that has kept them in poverty and that has kept their people under the thumb of Roman oppression. That manger is not a set piece in a nativity play. If you want to see a modern day manger, you can find a homeless woman who's just given birth because Mary was a homeless woman who had just given birth, caring for her baby the very best she and her husband could. That was a little darkness in their own lives into which we trust this light shined. And we know they eventually found a home 
we know they had family. We know they were, as some interpreters tell us, probably ordinary working class Jews of the time. The sort who might be in a fishing community or have a small carpentry business. But at least on that night, it may have been very dark indeed. So when the light shines in the darkness, a light that the darkness cannot put out, something extraordinary must be going on. And what the church has always said is the extraordinary thing that's going on is God coming to be with us. actually one of us, not just near us, not like an animated puppet in which God pulls the strings and the body of Jesus acts, but a real human being with fears and anxieties, with uncertainties, with human reason with a human will, with human temptations, with human uncertainty about the future, with sometimes even that human anguish of not knowing where God is right now. A human being who, like all of us, would die. When God became a human being, God chose all of the darkness. Not only the darkness, but did choose all of the darkness. There is no place, no little hint of corner of shadow that Christ didn't come to set with blazing light but not as an outsider with a big giant flashlight, but as an insider entering into it, knowing it, being it, doing it. It's the difference between the condescension of somebody who says they're there, it will be all right, and who has never had a trial in their lives, and the earnest help of a 12-step group where somebody who has been there and knows it can empathize with authenticity. That's what it means for light to shine in the darkness. From antiquity, one of the nice phrases that the church used for this is that God became a human being so that human beings would become God. God became a human being so that human beings would become God. Now they didn't mean this in the new agey kind of way that we're all divine spirits. They meant something a little harder to take than that. They meant that we become the kind of people humanity was always intended to be. We become the kind of people who are consistently and uniformly light for those around us and not darkness. As if we have been so set on fire by that light that it shines through us to others we become transparent so that through us, those around us can only see Christ. That's the goal. Most of us aren't there yet. But that's the trajectory. God became a human being so that human beings would become God. Reversing that story from the Garden of Eden, 
Remember, there were two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And humanity was told to stay away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but didn't. And then God said, well, we need to do something about this. If we let them take from the tree of life now, they'll become like us. We can't have that. But it turns out we can have that. It turns out that we can go and grasp the fruit from the tree of life that it's offered to us, that it came to us like light into the darkest of dark places. That's what I think we're here for tonight. Most of us have mixed motives. We're here for more than one thing. That's fine. God's pretty good at working through mixed motives. The worst thing in the world is to say, well, your motives aren't pure. You might as well not try. That's the same attitude that says that only perfect singers should sing. It's the same attitude that says you shouldn't write a poem unless you're as good as Carl Sandburg. That's a dark attitude. The light attitude is to find whatever hint of flame burns within us. And God bends down like a Boy Scout desperate to get a fire going and blows that tinder into a bonfire. We ought to be terrified by this because what God would really like us to do is become ablaze, set us on fire, make us into bonfires of love. So transformed that the world is terrified by us. But God will start wherever we are. One of the things about babies, I've been told, is that new parents never quite expect what's going to happen. I mean, they expect it, but then it happens, and it's different. I, I, think no I think it's one of those things that no matter how much you think you know what it's going to be, and no matter how right you are about that, you are still never got it. Again, I'm, I'm going by report here, but this is what I've heard from people I trust. It's a little bit like that with baby Jesus, you know. Baby Jesus is not just a nice little painted thing sitting in that pretty crib with some cute little shepherds played by six-year-olds standing around. Baby Jesus, remember, is that homeless poor kid sitting in a feeding trough with smelly animals who are probably trying to get the food under his head, terrifying Mary while this is all going on. And you can't just pick up a baby any way you like, right? Especially a newborn baby doesn't hold its head up. You have to cradle it carefully. There's a right way to do it. Well, one of the things we do to, to live into God's desire to transform us into blazing bonfires is we come here and we come to communion. And I'm going to give you a little bit of practical instruction about coming to communion. Because every now and then it's helpful to have in mind that raw physicality of what we do. This advice is very, very old. It comes from Cyril of Alexandria. Cyr I'm sorry, Cyril of Jerusalem. What was I thinking? He says, when you come forward and you receive the bread, you take your left hand and you make it a throne for your right hand, and the minister puts the bread in your hand. 
That's a little throne. It's a little exaltation of Christ. A little lifting up. And then you raise it and take it in. Those are the stage directions. And if you have a disability and you can't do that, it's fine. This is not about controlling people. And if you would rather receive on the tongue, that's fine. But that's the meaning of that gesture, making a throne. My wish for you all this Christmas is to see in that gift what we have received already from God. It's not about what you give, said my brother Karakin today on Facebook. Stranger says to him, well, you know, the meaning of the season is about giving. And he said, no, I think it's about receiving. Tonight, I think it's enough for us just to focus on what we have been given and give thanks for it.